Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. We are so excited that you are joining us for the show today. This podcast aims to explore a biblical life view in a conversational tone. Let's join our host and founder of Servants of Grace, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening. Today's episode is brought to you by Lexum Press. This is the Lexum Press website to receive 30% off of Kevin Van Duzer's latest. Hearers and doers. To purchase your copy, simply go to lexumpress.com slash Van Hooser to order your copy for 30% off today. Welcome back to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. My name is Dave and I'm the host for this podcast. And with me today, I have the great pleasure of talking with Dr. Michael Haken. Dr. Haken, welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, sir. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for agreeing to come on. Uh, can you uh, please tell us about your life, marriage, ministry, and some of the current ministry projects that you're working on? Yes, I'm a uh, professor of church history. I teach full-time at the um, uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I also have a teaching uh, appointment in uh, Canada in uh Heritage Theological Seminary in Cambridge, Ontario, and do, you know, teaching uh, a variety of other places uh, from time to time. Um, born in England, uh, raised Roman Catholic, uh, Irish mother, uh, Catholic mother. Father was Kurdish, is Kurdish, um, from Iraq, uh, Muslim background. He would have uh, become a, Ca- a Roman Catholic before my birth. And um, came to Canada in the ni- mid-1960s as a boy um, and um, uh, became through the, in the late 60s, early 70s, got kind of swept up in all of that. Uh, students on rec, uh, so I would have been a committed Marxist at some point, um, but was converted uh, through the gospel at Sandy Avenue Baptist Church in Hamilton, and that through the, particularly through the witness of my wife, she, a woman who became my wife. Um, I met her and asked her to go to church, and that's where I found Christ, and uh, thanks to call to ministry, uh, studied at uh, Wycliffe College in the University of Toronto, uh, church history, went on to get a PhD there, and then uh, during that time was married uh, to Allison, who is uh, Scottish in background, Church of Scotland, uh, but became Baptist in uh, Canada, and um, uh, we have two children, uh, Victoria, who lives in Vienna with her husband and uh, in Austria, and our son Nigel, who is studying law at the University of Western Ontario in London. Um, as I said, I'm a historian. I'm not ordained, and uh, I've never been a pastor so my whole life has been really one, one that's focused in academic. Taught for a number of years at Central Baptist Seminary, which is now Heritage, and then was the academic dean, our uh, principal at Toronto Baptist Seminary before assuming the present position at uh, Southern in 2006. Seven. Um, my focus of my teaching career is patristic, particularly fourth century. Um, that's what I did my PhD in. Uh, and then in more recent, well, not the more recent years, probably from the late 80s onwards, I've also uh, focused focused on British descent, those outside the Church of England in the 18th century, particularly Baptist, and um, in that regard have founded a thing called the Andrew Fuller Center for Baptist Studies at the Southern Seminary. And among our projects, major projects, is a critical edition of the works of Andrew Fuller, which is being published by the German publishing house uh, Walter de Groita, which is based in Berlin and Boston. Um, current ministry projects um, just had a book uh, just released on Andrew Fuller, on being a pastor. Fuller has left left as probably the largest collection of ordination sermons from the 18th century, uh, about 30 or so, and um, so it's based on his view of pastoral ministry and how we can learn from that today. I did it in conjunction with a pastor in Louisville named Brian Croft, who has something of an international ministry, and has done a number of books dealing with pastoral ministry, and I wanted somebody to work with me who could uh, relate it to pastoral ministry today, which I could not, really, and uh, he did a great job, and so that is coming out with EP. I should be out uh, shortly, and um, the other more recent book was the one that, that we're going to be talking about on loving God and neighbor with Samuel Pierce by Lexham Press. Before we get to the book, do you want to say a little bit for our listeners who aren't uh, familiar with the Andrew Fuller Center? What what is it about, and and those types of things? Yeah, the Andrew Fuller Center uh, is uh, kind of a research center. We put on conferences. We do two conferences a year normally. A big conference in the fall. So our next big conference will be 2020 fall 2020. 
Tony, we're doing uh, Christian thinking, a Christian history of angels. And we're looking at how various authors have looked at angels. Um, we've done a variety of conferences in the past, baptism war, uh, issues of persecution, and then those that are more focused on Baptist studies. Uh, we also publish a booklet, uh, occasional booklets on Baptist studies, usually about 40, 50 pages long, do two or three of those a year. Uh, they focus on Baptists like John Fawcett, for example, uh, the author of the famous hymn, uh, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, um, or things like on John Bunyan, uh, or maybe William Carey. And then uh, we also have a small conference in the spring, which is usually just a half a day. Um, the Fuller Center also is the heart of the Andrew Fuller Center, the Andrew Fuller Works Project, which I mentioned earlier there, the critical edition of all of Fuller's works. Fuller was the kind of theological brains behind William Carey. Uh, Carey would never have gone to India without Fuller, and uh, Fuller sustained his ministry by uh, financial fundraising, creating a society uh, called the Baptist Missionary Society. So he's a very, very important figure at the heart of the globalization of Christianity. Mm. And that's really what we want to do in the center. We want to think about how Baptist studies uh, contribute to the larger uh, global mission of the church and how uh, Baptist studies fit into the, what they've contributed to, to the state of Christianity today. That's wonderful. Um, I love that. Well, can you uh, tell us a bit about your latest book with Jerry Slate, Loving God and Neighbor with Samuel Pierce, why you wrote it, and how uh, how do you hope it will be received? Yeah, the book uh, is written in conjunction with Jerry. Uh, Jerry is a pastor, um, and again, um, uh, the, the, the challenge of writing a book about a pastor for somebody who's never been a pastor like myself, uh, it's helpful sometimes uh, to have somebody like Jerry come alongside and write uh, sections of it that deal with pastoral ministry. Um, Jerry actually contacted me. I've been working on <clears throat> Samuel Pierce for quite a while. I've done probably about 10 or 12 articles on him, popular, some more academic. And then I edited the in the critical edition of Andrew Fuller's work, Fuller's biography of Pierce which is his memoirs of Pierce. Now, that's a very academic work. Uh, it's a hardback, sells for about $120. So it's a fairly... Uh, it's not the sort of thing that's going to get a popular circulation. And so I was thrilled when Jerry approached me about doing a biography. Um, I, he actually he informed me that he was doing one himself, wanted information on Pierce, because he knew that I had done work on Pierce. And I said, why don't, why don't we do something together? Because I'd, like, I'd been wanting to do something on a more popular vein for a while. And um, we wrote it because we're convinced that Samuel Pierce, who died at the age of 33, um, and was regarded uh, by those who knew him as just a, um, an incredibly holy man, a man who... Uh, exemplified the great and holiness of God in his life in so many facets that really, he really needed to be known better in our day. We know a number of people in our day like uh, Robert Murray McShane, David Brainerd, well, uh, Pierce has been described as the Baptist Brainerd. Hmm. And during the 19th century, his memoirs were never out of print. But in the 20th century, when, I guess, theological tastes have changed in the 20th century, um, uh, his, his, his memory is being somewhat completely eclipsed. And so the book was, the goal of the book is to kind of reintroduce him and to see how his own love for God, which spilled over, and rightly so, into love for his neighbor, how that can help us today. And I'm really hoping it gets a wide circulation. Lexham Press is a great press to work with, just tremendous in so many ways. I've, I've been involved in publishing. I didn't mention earlier, but um, I was uh, the editorial director of a publishing house, Joshua Press, now an imprint of H&E Publishing. And so I've, I've been in that world for a long time, and um, it's thrilling to work with Lexham Press, both in terms of... Um, uh, not only getting the book published uh, in terms of content being uh, correctly uh, printed, but also the, the, the type of book, the, the paper used, the font, the layout, all of that. They're just very, very professional. I'm very impressed with them. That's uh, that's wonderful to hear. And um, I've also been impressed with h and &E. I'm, I'm publishing my first book with them, which I, I think you... Oh, I I think you knew that, uh, if you didn't. Um, I did not know that. I'm, no. I'm writing on the problem of biblical illiteracy and what to do about it. Maybe we could talk about that another time. But oh, wow. I'm, uh, I did I'm, not I'm, know I'm, about that. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm, I'm, loving, uh, I'm loving working with them. I think that they're awesome. I want to I wanna promote them and uh, every opportunity I can. And, and uh, just, just been very impressed with their overall philosophy of ministry. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be part of the h &E family. Well, can you uh, please give us a brief overview of Samuel Pierce's life and ministry? Yeah, Pierce 
is from the West Country in England. That means he's from, uh, it's actually from the county of Devon, but the West Country is Cornwall, Devon, uh, Somerset, Wiltshire, Bristol area. Um, uh, kind of a unique area in many ways, its own kind of cultural background. Uh, he was born in Plymouth. Um, which is a very famous port, a place where the British had a significant uh, amount of their navy. And so growing up as a Baptist, the son of a, a Baptist deacon in a context like that would have been difficult because sailors tend to be rough and ready. And during his teen years, he kind of got swept up in the kind of evil that sometimes can accompany that naval culture. And uh, but was converted, uh, be in his mid-teens, baptized, and within a very quick period of time, the congregation, the Baptist congregation at Plymouth, which stretched back to the 1640s, um, one of the oldest congregations in the British Isles, Baptist Witness, um, sent he had, a, he, he had a, 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 a gifts that could be used for vocational ministry. So they gave him some opportunities in the church and then uh, encouraged him to go to the only seminary for Baptist, uh, the Baptist uh, denomination, which was uh, Bristol Baptist Academy, where there would have been about 20 students at the time. It was never huge compared to seminaries today. But it was one in which he developed a number of friendships, um, confirmed his calling, and he really only had one charge, pastoral charge. It was at Birmingham, uh, in the heart of the Midlands. I was born in Birmingham, so that was that's another reason for my attraction to him. Hmm. Um, grew up in Birmingham, which is very heavy industrial center now center for a lot of um, Muslim immigrants. In those days, uh, it was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and uh, he labored in this uh, town for about 10 years, uh, from 1789 to 1799, and um, really God owned his ministry remarkably. Uh, on average, about 35 converts a year uh, who were baptized, brought into the church. That doesn't sound like a lot, but when he comes in 1789 and he leaves, when he dies in 1799, there's been about 350 added to the church through his mm. ministry. Uh, that doesn't include others converted um, who didn't join the church for whatever reason, nor does it include um, about four or five church plants that the congregation started during his ministry. They started a Sunday school to educate the many of the migrant workers who had come into the city, uh, not so much migrant, but workers who had been attracted to the city because of the factories who couldn't read or write. Uh, and then with a short period of time, they had about over a thousand in the Sunday school, which they would have had on Sunday afternoon. And um, he's a very close friend of Kerry, uh, wants to go out to India, in the providence of God, did not go. But um, the letters to William Carey, who's obviously a well, very well-known figure uh, in global mission, um, are really some of the most precious letters. And in, in many ways, Carey had a number of friends, but Pierce, was uh, the one who really kind of channeled the love of God um, into Terry's life to some degree through his written correspondence. Um, in his lifetime, he was known as the seraphic Pierce, hmm. uh, an a adjective seraphic after the seraphim of Isaiah. Um, and the seraphim are those angels who are constantly praising God. And uh, he had that effect on people, just a, a man who led people to have a deep sense of God um, in their lives. And uh, William J., who was the a minister of Bath, um, about 50 years, he knew he knew Pierce as a young man, and about 50 years after Pierce's death, when he was quite an elderly man, he, he said um, uh, the having time with 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 uh, Pierce uh, left you with just a deep sense of the presence of God. Uh, what 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 what. what what a savor of God does communion with such a man leave uh, upon the soul, he said. So he was quite a remarkable man, uh, died very young of uh, tuberculosis, uh, one of the great killers of that period. And um, his memoirs were written by another friend, Andrew Fuller, and were a bestseller. Wow, that's incredible. Um, well, how did Pierce's view of friendship contribute to his life and ministry? Well, I think uh, one of the things that uh, uh, impressed me um, was the way in which uh, at the heart of the what we call the Baptist Missionary Society or the the kind of pioneering work of William Carey was uh, was a circle of friends and Pierce really was in some respects the kind of the glue uh, uh, in, by the grace of God that kind of helped bind some of these friends together. Um, uh, a remarkably, as I said, um, a man who, in whom really kind of 10 years 
uh, 50 years of Christian life, you know, given, you know, the average age, maybe of 70 or 80, uh, uh, was kind of jammed into 10 years. And um, friendship was very important to, to Pierce, as it was to all of these men. And I think what drew me to Pierce was that, that whole area of friendship. And also um, uh, his letters to his wife, they're about... 75 letters that he wrote to his wife, the majority of which have never been published. They were the first things I really read about Pierce, of Pierce. I uh, read those in the um, uh, very late 70s, uh, very late 80s is when I first came across those. Yeah, I think I think uh, one of the reasons I asked this question is because I think that for, for people in ministry or just in their Christian life, we have we, we need to recover a, a Christian view of, of friendship because it's so it's so important for for accountability, for care, for well for, for so many reasons to, to one another, each other, we could go on and on and, and so um, I, I was just really impressed by uh, Pierce's uh, view of, of friendship as I read this book. So Yeah. I, um, I'm, uh, I'm for, for a variety of reasons. I've, it's been a theme of my writing career, uh, Christian perspectives on friendship, Christian friends, circle of Christian friends. And I think I could say, after uh, having spent a considerable amount of time thinking about this subject, that whenever God does a great work in the history of the Church, it's always through a circle of friends. Now, given our emphasis on a celebrity culture in the West in the last while, we tend to focus on one figure. So in this case, it's Carrie. So I collect biographies of Carrie, and I've got about 70 to 80 biographies of Carrie that have been published between his death, 1834, and the present day. Um, and yet, of his friends, say John Sutcliffe, there's one. Uh, John Ryland, there's really none. Um, uh, jo- uh, Samuel Pierce, well, now there's this one. There were two or three in the uh, twenty in the nineteenth uh, century. Uh, one of one at the very beginning of the twentieth. Andrew Fuller, maybe there's half a dozen. And what we've done is we've tended to focus on one figure. We've done the same, for example, with Calvin. Um, there's a whole circle of friends around Calvin who people don't know about, like Pierre Verre and uh, William Farrell or Guillaume Farrell. Um, the Apostle Paul had a circle of friends: Timothy, Titus, um, Aquila, Priscilla. Uh, these sorts of individuals. Tychicus, uh, Trophimus, um, but we only focus on the, the main figure. And in doing so, we, we may really miss this very precious truth that um, the forward motion or forward movement of the kingdom of God or these remarkable turning points in the history of the church, it's it circles of friends who are used by God to accomplish these things. Yeah, that's that's really good. Really good. What, what does Samuel Pierce have to say to pastors and ministry leaders about political activism today? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a challenging issue. Uh, Baptists in the 18th century were, in some respects, um, let me let me look at the broader picture and then come down to Pierce. In some respects, they were in reaction against where Baptists had been uh, during the 17th century. Um, a lot of Baptists had been swept up into the Civil War armies uh, fighting against the monarchy in the middle of the 17th century. And um, then there had come a time of enormous persecution when the Republican government of Oliver Cromwell, in which Baptists fe- featured largely, or featured fairly significantly, that collapsed and the monarchy was restored and Baptists were persecuted. And during the 18th century, Baptists wanted to demonstrate their loyalty to king and country. And until the end of the century, and then the, you have the American Revolution, and um, pretty well most Baptists in America supported the Revolution, and many of the Baptists in England were in favor of the Revolution because uh, they wanted to see, they still didn't have complete freedom of worship and religion in England. Uh, there were things that they could not do as Baptists. And um, there was a danger for or Baptist, in the minds of Baptist leaders like Andrew Fuller and Samuel Pierce, that Baptists get so involved in politics that they forget that they have a, a much greater calling, which is the spread of the gospel. And so while they were uh, involved in certain political issues, so uh, Pierce, for example, um, preached a sermon against the civil, um, uh, the, the laws that were on the on the books against Baptists, for instance, participating uh, in university or um, in the army or navy, you couldn't be a, you could not be a Baptist and be a commissioned officer in the army or navy. You couldn't be a Baptist and graduate from one of the two universities in England, Oxford or Cambridge. And so, Peter's as a sermon uh, against the laws that 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 um, um, en- en- enabled those 
uh, areas of discrimination. Um, but he was also very cautious about getting too involved in politics of the danger that politics could bring. He was also very interesting. There's a newspaper account I came across um, relating to the slave trade and indications, very clear indications, very explicit indications that Pierce was involved to some degree in the fight against the abolition of slavery, uh, abolition of the slave trade. And um, so uh, it's not an easy question to answer. And uh, there is a wariness on the part of people like Pierce and Fuller to significant political involvement. On the other hand, there is a recognition that there are certain issues that they must speak, speak out about. Uh, slavery was a great ethical issue of the day, and it, it's encouraging to see these men speaking about this issue of enormous social injustice. Yeah. Yeah, um, I know this question is uh, it's it's really loaded. You know, we we see people uh, on the news and print and media speaking out, and I, and I was just curious um, what he would have to, what Pierce would have to say say to us, whether uh, you know you avoid that or or not those types of things. So. I think I think that's helpful. Um, what what is the best? What are Pierce's best suggestions for honoring and encouraging one's pastor or pastors? Um, very good question. Uh, it's not one that I think is easily answered in one sense. Um, I think Pierce would certainly encourage uh, congregations um, uh, to pray for their ministers. I think that's something that um, we often forget the necessity of prayer for those in leadership. Particularly in our day, um, we've had far too many um, leaders in the Christian community, the larger evangelical community, um, fall into this sin or that sin. And uh, I'm not saying that their congregations didn't pray for them, but uh, prayer is certainly an enormous help for pastors. Um, Pierce would also be part of a culture that encouraged a regular church attendance. Um, I, I fear that we're in a context because of the, the way in which we can easily access demonic material through various forms of social media. Um, there is the danger that people think, well, I can listen to a sermon online. I don't necessarily have to go to church. Um, but the physical presence of believers meeting together, which Scripture enjoins, um, is of a great encouragement to pastoral leadership. And uh, I'm pretty certain he would encourage uh, Christians to be involved in that regard. And Pierce also um, recognized his need, just as he was part of a larger circle of friends that supported Carrie and the mission to India, um, he also recognized that in the local church, there needed to be that sort of support for church planting around uh, where he lived in Birmingham. And so I think he would be uh, encouraging us to make sure that we're involved, not only attending church, but involved in the work of the church. Um, the Baptists in this period were very conscious that the advance of the kingdom through a local church, um, what that local church is doing in its given geographical area, it's not just the pastor, it's not just preaching. Uh, all, all believers have a gift uh, that they are to use for for the building of the body, the extension of the kingdom in, in a given geographical locale. That's a great answer. A great answer. How did how did the Bible guide and shape Pierce both personally and in his ministry to others? Um, he, well, uh, Baptist. In his day, like peers, are committed to an inerrant scripture. They believe fully that the, the Bible is the inspired word of God. Um, the preaching of the word was central to his piety, but also private reading of the word. Um, we have context, we know of context where he would meet with um, people like Fuller and Carey, uh, spend a day of fasting and prayer and Bible reading and Bible reflection. Um, I don't know of a text where he talks about Bible memorization, but that would also be very much part of this culture, uh, memorizing the scriptures so that you might be able to meditate on them. Not memory work for simply the sake of memory work, but memorization of the scriptures for meditation. So um, the, the, the emphasis on the scriptures as the inerrant word of God uh, is absolutely at the heart of, of his ministry and uh, should be at the heart of ours. And uh, the 20th century, obviously, and early 21st century, have seen very different kinds of winds blowing, but uh, he, he, his generation experienced the same. His, his generation was the beginning of the rise of liberal criticism of the Bible, uh, men thinking that they could adhere to Christianity and yet question portions of the foundations, the biblical foundations. And uh, 
peers at his generation experienced that, that those sort of attacks. And his friend Andrew Fuller was very much in the forefront of defending the Bible against attacks. So uh, Pierce would have would have you'd ask Pierce, well, what has to be foundational to the life of a church? Uh, a an inerrant inspired word of God. Yeah, uh, I live in California. I think you know that, Dr. Haken, and I, I deal with this issue all the time. There's all sorts of people, even just the other day, oh, well, you know, all the people that believe the same Bible, uh, believe the Bible or one por- portion of it or whatever, they, I was told, uh, uh, well, they all believe the same thing. They all have the same higher power. It's like, really? Like, that's really what you want to say to me? Um, uh, I'm thinking this and I'm like, actually, no, ma'am. Um, you're, you're not right. <laughs> There's, they, they have different Bibles, like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. They, they have a different Bible. And I, I was trying to get her to understand, like, you, they have different convictions about the scriptures, you know? And, and she's like, no, it's just a matter of how it was translated and, and, and that's part of it, but but it's like underneath that, you know, there's convictions and, and what you believe about the Bible will influence how it's translated. And, and anyway, I, I she didn't get it. And she, I, she, I don't think she understood that. So even, no matter how clear I was, it, she couldn't, uh, she couldn't, she couldn't get that idea. And, and, and you're just so right all around us, whether you're talking to a, a non-Christian or, or even a Christian, it's, it's all around us. So well said. Do we need men again like Samuel Pierce and what would they look like in terms of their character and their ministry? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, we, we, we can't replicate people exactly from the past, but Pierce, uh, just the sense of the preciousness of living for Christ and the hunger to grow in, in, in the image of Christ and the hunger to know God and the hunger to live a holy life. Well, I think uh, one of the challenges of our current generation is because we've experienced a lot of the, you know, it, it's helpful to take a look at the big picture and not just you know, the, the, the last 10, 15 years. But if you look at the last 100 years, what we've, what we've gone through is uh, the rise of, in North America, the rise of liberalism and the response to liberalism, one of the key responses was what we call fundamentalism. And at the heart of fundamentalism, uh, there, was a, there was a hunger for holiness. But the way in which it often was out, way in which it was often played out or lived out was really what we would describe today as a legalism now. And so in the last 40, 50 years, we've, we've reacted to that evangelicalism, which in some respects, in one respect, North American evangelicalism is a child of the fundamentalist movement. In another respect, it's not because it go, its roots, clearly genealogical roots, go back to the, the Reformers, the Puritans, and the 18th century revivals. But evangelicalism has been shaped by fundamentalism. And the way it's been shaped by fundamentalism is by reaction to fundamentalism. And, and so evangelicals uh, were on a pendulum swing away from the legalism of some of our forebears. And those forebears were, were many of them remarkable men and women, but they, they, some of them were very, they were, there was a legalism. But I think we've gone to the point now that there is really kind of almost a, a practical antinomianism at work here. And rather than taking seriously James's words in James 1, 27, uh, that true religion is not only to take care of widows and orphans, but to keep oneself on spotted or on stained from the world, that's almost a verse. It would be very difficult in many circumstances today to preach on that, because I think uh, evangelicalism uh, ha- is cozying up to the world. And there are ideological reasons why we've done that. Some of it's in reaction to fundamentalism. Some of it is uh, seeking to win the world. Um, some of it is a danger, uh, this, a fear of Phariseeism. But I think Pierce shows us what, what holiness can look like and why we should long to be a holy people mm-hmm. and how God uses such a man. It was his friend Andrew Fuller who said once at a, in an ordination sermon that uh, eminent spirituality often leads to and usually leads to uh, or Eminent, yeah, eminent spirituality often leads to, and usually leads to, a life of eminent usefulness. And he ties eminent usefulness for the kingdom back to eminent spirituality. And that, that, if there's anything that sums up Pierce's life, it's that. It's that statement. Uh, Fuller didn't say it about Pierce, but I think it does sum up Pierce's life. That Pierce's life was one of, there was eminent useful. He was useful in the hands of a holy master. And the reason why was because he, he, he had a life of eminent spirituality. That is, that is so well said and so needed. That, that message is 
is so needed. Well, uh, Dr. Haken, as we wrap up, do you have any uh, takeaways on this uh, about Pierce or anything else that we've covered that, that you would like to say to our listeners? Yeah, I think, I think one of the things that, you know, studying the life of Pierce has helped me see is that our, our, our first of all, the, the importance of the past. We, we, need to, we need to know the history of the church much better than we do. And I'm talking here about lay people. I'm not talking here about academics like myself. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not pleading for academic uh, people to become historians, but I'm pleading for pastors and church leaders to, to, to introduce their people to, to models from the past, the men and women from the past, um, either in you know, allusions or references in sermonic material, the use of Sunday school, sometimes maybe have a one day a year or a church history day. Um, and then more specifically, uh, we need to recognize um, that there are many figures who we, we never talk about. We, you know, we, as I said earlier, where the, the evangelicals are enamored with Kerry, but what about all the men around him and women around him? And uh, they need to be recognized as well. And so I think Peter more broadly speaks to us about the importance of how studying the life of a person from the past can help us. And then specifically, some of these kind of hidden individuals, these unknown individuals. And um, uh, that that really is, I think, very, 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 very important. We've had a number of publishing houses, um, you know, that have done some tremendous work in alerting us to the past, like the Banner of Truth. But in some ways, there are people who've been forgotten. And uh, I was amazed when I began to study peers how how virtually nothing was available about them. Hmm. And uh, there are probably some reasons for that. Um, but some of these people who are, you know, I think we, we need to recognize that sometimes um, some of the greatest work has been done through men and women who we don't know much about. Um, and we, we, need, we need to know that. We need to know these, these individuals. So broadly speaking, the importance, though, of church history for present-day uh, faithfulness to the gospel. Uh, well said. I couldn't have said it any better than you did. Oh, where can people go to find more about uh, your work on social media or just your writing in general? Um, yeah, the, um, well, the Andrew Fuller Center has a website uh, at the Southern Seminary website. It's www.andrewfullercenter, uh, that's all one word, dot .org. So Andrew Fuller Center, lowercase Andrew, uh, Fuller lowercase, Center lowercase, C-E-N-T-E-R, dot .org. So andrewfullercenter.org. Uh, I have articles up there. I have a regular blog that comes out twice a week on historical subjects uh, it's, and uh, conference materials up there, etc. Well, Dr. Haken, thank you so much uh, on behalf of our listeners who so appreciate you, and I do as well. Um, you've been nothing but encouraging to me every time we've interacted over email, and I, I just so appreciate that and, and all the work that you do. So may God richly bless you, sir. Thank you, Dave. Tremendous to be with you. Thank you, sir. I'd like to thank Lexham Press for sponsoring today's episode. Don't forget to visit the Lexham Press website at lexhampress.com slash vanhooser to receive 30% off of Kevin Van Hooser's book, Heroes and Doers. Thank you so much for listening. We hope that you were encouraged by today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you get your podcast. For more uplifting and thought-provoking content, please visit us online at servantsofgrace.org. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Servants of Grace and on Facebook at facebook.com slash servantsofgrace. We hope you have a blessed day and we will see you next time.